Hi, my name is Gary Taylor, and in this video, I want to cover messaging queues part two. Um, I know I talked a lot for the messaging queues in part one, but I really do have a lot more to say, so I thought I'd say it. I want to cover exactly what a message is and the problem that we're trying to solve. So with this, you can imagine that we have a unit of work that we need to do. And we need to store a single data item, for instance, sending an email. And if we've got a new customer engaging with us and we send them the login credentials, we don't want that to be lost. We don't want the possibility of them having to contact us because that introduces friction into the journey and there's a chance that we'll lose that customer. So we never want to lose that data. And of course, everything needs to be fast, scalable and distributed and amazing. Uh, but the key bits for that is to decouple it. Now, messaging queues is designed to decouple. We can take something which is a complex system, for instance, a messaging or a communication platform that sends push notifications, emails, text messages and logging services, all as part of this bundle. And we can split it into individual parts. This is very similar to service architecture or microservices, but it just allows us to actually use a messaging bus to do this. This has been in existence for decades. So we take a slice of this service out, like the messaging email service, and we move it. We take all of that code out and just replace it all and put it into a new service. In some cases, it's kind of nice to actually just take this code out, modularize it, and then refactor it once we know it, it's working. And it gives us a, a way of being able to refactor uh, high value adding pieces of work. Like for instance here, I've not um, selected email and logging uh, just for giggles. Um, emailing is something that's used everywhere and in all of our systems. So it would be a good piece, a good feature to move out into a separate system. So that if I have a testimonial system, a CRM, a marketing, or even a new customer with new business requirements, I don't want to have to rewrite all of that code again. I just want to be able to use a centralized email service. Now, that could be a centralized API. We could have a dedicated microservice that's dedicated to that. Or we could make the problem a little more simpler for developers, a little more simple. It doesn't need to be a fully fledged API because it is only uh, the one organization and it's not for external consumption. Then why make it an API? We're just building all of these features. Until your system game's complex enough to require that, don't have it. So for now, we can just separate the email service out into uh, a messaging service. And now all of these four systems here can call the messaging service directly, drop the message in, and something somewhere will send the email. But why? Well, I talked about it before, it's about uh, the business requirement for it to be a hundred percent delivery rate, never down, never failing. Um, the line of code won't ignore it. So if it fails, if the exchange server has a network blip, your code has to retry. If the email server is down that day, you still need to be able to send them. So they need to be held somewhere and retried when the service comes back online. So how many times have you wrote some code that customer logs are, customer registers to your website, it creates the email account and it sends the email. And if the email server was down, you'll get a try catch and you just carry on. You didn't send the email. The business didn't send that engagement email to the customer and the business is now losing money. An unknown amount of engagement is being lost just because of an empty try catch, which sounded good because, you know, you, you don't want the whole registration process to fail, but that email is needed. We need 100% delivery, even if our email servers are off, even if there was a network glitch, even if there was a communication problem, it needs to try. Even if the email address is wrong and it gets a bounce back, we need to try again. 
we need to flag it and show it to someone that this message has got a problem. A human being can look at an email and go, oh, they've put a comma instead of a dot, you know, Gmail, comma, com. You know, bad filtering on the UI point, but do you know what? That happens. And it doesn't take five seconds for a human being to correct that mistake and resend that message. But if this is just done in code and it didn't work, so it just fails, try, catch, and move on, we've lost it. So we need to be able to decouple data from the sender and the processor. So the person producing that message and the person consuming that message, we are so used to writing code that is just line after line after line of business logic. And if one line fails, it might have a try catch around it and it just carries on. Or worse still, it has a, a catch with a go to and an error, you know, VB style if you're, if you're that old. Um, th this is just terrible. It means that the business thinks the code is doing something and the system is doing something, but it isn't. Next, it's copy and pasting code everywhere. I mean, how many times do you send an email within a system? So you might have that code in multiple places. If you've got different pieces of code, uh, sorry, let me say that again, different uh, pieces of software, like a CRM somewhere, uh, uh, a compliance piece of software, a marketing software, and the separate pieces of software, you might have that code copied and pasted. You might have gone a step further and you've got a NuGet package where you share it amongst all of these services. But what happens if the email server is changing next week? The location is going to change. Uh, they're going to turn off TLS 1.1 or whatever it is support. Or the authentication is changing. How quickly can you change all of them services to point to your new email server? Probably not very quickly. And that's going to be a bad day. Probably as a department, you're going to have to say to your product owner, we can't do it in the sprint. You know, that is going to take us two, if not three sprints before we can deliver it. Certainly can't be done by next week. And if you do try and change the email server next week, all of the services will fail. So we can't do it. To solve that problem, you can move the email to a messaging system. And when you call that messaging system, we delegate responsibility. Hey, you deal with it. I don't care how. Send a message onto a messaging queue and walk away. And someone somewhere will actually process that message. Somebody somewhere will take that message and send it to that email address. And if it fails, it'll retry. If the network's down, it'll retry when the network comes up. And um, if there's a problem, it can hold that message and say, I couldn't deliver this message. There's something wrong. I can't process it. And a human being can have a look or a developer, uh, second line support can have a look at that and see, oh, they've put a comma instead of a dot. They can change it and repost this message onto the queue and it gets processed. So no request to do work is ever lost. So before I finish up with part two, I just want to show you a little bit of a demo. And the demo hopefully will just give you a better representation of what it is I've been talking about for the last 30 minutes. Apologies. Um, here is a simulator for a queuing system. And it's a queuing system I'm going to use in this video called RabbitMQ. There are many queuing systems and they all have pros and cons. But realistically, for a simple queuing system, they're all as good as each other. Um, and RabbitMQ and... Uh, uh, active MQ, the, the great queuing systems. So first off, I want a producer. I want something that flags some kind of action. So I'm going to call this email producer because this is the thing that's going to produce this message. And the message needs to go somewhere. It's, uh, it's not just going to shout into the ether. Um, we're going to shout it at an exchange. And we're going to link these two up by drawing this line here. And I'm just going to call this the default exchange. Default exchange. 
And now we've got that and the email producer is linked to an exchange. When it sends a message, it'll go to the exchange, but the exchange doesn't know what to do with it and it can get lost. So we must be able to have somewhere to hold that message for a short amount of time. You may have guessed it from the very primitive list on the side. That's a queue. So if we drop a queue into this platform, let's call this uh, email queue. There we go. Right, so the email queue now needs to subscribe to this exchange. And what happens now is an email comes in. Might be better if I change it that way so you can actually read the words. So email producer sends an email. It sends it to the default exchange and the default exchange then sends it on to the queue. So let's have a look at that. Let's have a look at um, a basic payload. So to uh, gpltaylor at gmail.com. Obviously this is just test, nothing's gonna happen. Uh, body equals hello queue. And I think that's valid, Jason. We'll soon find out. And I wanna send it every two seconds. So we can see now a message coming from a producer every two seconds goes to the exchange and then finds its way into the queue. And the queue is holding on to these messages for safe delivery. However, we do need something to process these messages. We have got our registration form, if you like, on your website. It's run that line of code to send the message onto the queue. That's the producer. It then walks away, doesn't care. The exchange, something that manages and, and works with, with queues, receives that message and holds it for a determined amount of time in this queue. We can see we're, we're getting up to 22, 23 messages now. So let's do something with this. We need a consumer, something that's going to consume their messages and do something with it. So I'm just going to drag in a consumer. I'm going to call this the email consumer not going to win any prizes for my naming conventions let's link them up so we can see now as the process we're getting the messages down at the bottom and that's processing all of these messages and you can see that as they come in they're being processed and you might be able to see that it's, it's going down slowly because we're going to work our way through the whole list. Eventually, we will be able to do it all. But this isn't quick enough. We might have thousands. So what I'm going to do is hook up another consumer. And it's the same code. It's just now we've got two consumers. So now we were able to get through that backlog of messages. Now, this is just the same uh, code it's just spout up twice so if it's a desktop application please don't do that then you can just open up another version on another computer hopefully you're using containers and you can just fire up a, a new container uh, using dockerized system so you can just fire up a new docker container it automatically registers and now we've got it but a really cool thing that's happening now is you can see we've got load balancing as emails come in it's now routing it to that one, and now to that one, and then to that one. Once we realize, do you know what? We're, we're handling this gracefully. We haven't got a queue of queues. You know, we're processing them all in real time. There isn't a buildup of queue messages like there were originally. So I can choose to turn off one of my consumers. There's a little bit of bug in here at the moment, I think. If I, if I simply delete this. I don't think it even lets me. Yeah, it's, it's not letting me at the moment. Um, so in real life, you can actually just uh, turn off that consumer and you're back to just having one, which is more than capable of handling that traffic. 
but 100% reliability may mean delivered within a certain amount of time, which means you might always have two consumers on just in case one of them has a wobble. Maybe it experiences a segment fault or a memory heat problem or something that causes the container to crash. Well, it doesn't matter because if that crashes, it detaches from the queue and in fact from the exchange really, but it, it detaches from the queuing system and therefore the exchange realizes that it can only deliver because there's only one uh, active consumer at the moment. So this is the essence of um, queuing. It's the reason behind it. It allows your producers to just simply call that code and say, send an email. It allows us to quickly spark up new instances. It allows load balancing. And it means that even if catastrophically both consumers go offline and there is nothing processing it, then the messages are still being held for delivery, for being processed. If that's a customer buying a product or uh, a transaction occurring, that is not going to get lost. We are not down for business. We're just not as active as we need to be. And that is where you then have multiple consumers running on multiple uh, clouds in multiple regions, multiple distributed zones. And now you can give 100% uptime you can guarantee that that message will be processed. But for your average company, this now allows you to write a simple producer, shred out all of the code that sends emails and put it into a very simple, clean, elegant, maybe .NET Core 6 if you wanna rock your socks today, a piece of system that is clean, elegant and simple. Now, when the business comes to you, and says we need to change the email server you know we're going up to 365 or we're changing authentication or we're finally cutting off support for tls uh 1.1 or whatever it is you could go yeah no problems let's get that on the sprint we're going to have it delivered in the two weeks no props so this is the last of the theory um i'm going to start diving into some real world examples in the next video i'm just going to play we're just going to play together go through some of the documentation and let's write some code hope you like this don't forget to give it a like and subscribe